Um, I'm Pauline McGovern. Um, the session, the Methods of Manchester session today is on path analysis, but I don't, I'm not going to tell you how to do a path analysis. What I want to do is to show you about how it might be useful in research um, and maybe inspire you to use it yourselves. Um, could I just ask, how many of you are basically qualitative researchers that you never take money from books? It's like any of you. You are. <laughs> okay. Um, the thing about path analysis is that although it's an advanced statistical method, it's not at all difficult to use. And at the basic level that I'm, I'm going to describe to you today, you only actually need three statistics. They are not difficult. <laughs> now, for those of you that tend to do qualitative research, it's actually an opportunity. Possibly there is, that you, you could use it in a mixed method. And I'll just say that actually it's not difficult or long-winded to do. And there's lots of data out there. It might not suit your, your research area, but there's lots of large-scale data sets out there. And there are lots of quantitative researchers. <laughs> so it is, as I hope that it might inspire some of you to at least think of um, path analysis as a possibility. Because it's a wonderful, I think it's a wonderful method to use. Now, um, I'm, I'm not assuming any knowledge of stats, so I hope you won't find it too low level. Um, I've, it really is quite basic. You don't need more than basic stats here. Um, so apologies to anyone if I'm telling you things you already know. Um, what I want to do is, we'll just, I'll just mention briefly what path analysis is, and then I want to use a real-life example so you can get an idea of what it is. And then I want to use an example from my own research, health research, to actually show you how research that can be so useful. Okay, so, and then we'll, we'll end up, cap off at the end with just a few things about path analysis and limitations and stuff. Now, the analysis that I'll be looking at is, is actually using a piece of software called AMOS, and it's um, an add-on to SDSS. It's not the only way to do path analysis, but that's the way I'm doing it today. Um, now, first of all, what is it? Okay. It basically corresponds to the way we all explain things in everyday life. Um, it's really a story with a series of events. And you can trace the path from an initial cause through to an outcome with all the intervening things in between. And that's what makes it such a beautiful method. And you actually, in doing a, a path model, you're actually putting a time order in there. So one of the things about path analysis is it's very good if you have a hypothesis to, te to test. You wouldn't tend to use it as, as an exploratory method. You would use it to try and confirm. And, and I'll elaborate on that as I go through. Okay. Um, okay. So now we'll come to our real life example, and it's from The Lord of the Rings. Okay. Oh, what's just happened? Hold on a minute. That's what I want. Okay. The Battle of Rohan, if you remember that from The Lord of the Rings. Now, in the Battle of Rohan, what do we know? We know that Saruman invaded Rohan, and we know that he was defeated. So that's initial cause, final outcome. Okay, but obviously there's lots of things that affected that outcome. It's not just a simple cause and effect. Okay, so what kind of things happen in between? Well, I just mentioned some of them. That maybe if you were doing a path model, mapping out what happened, how it came to that. Um, I mean, the first thing that happened was that Theoden left Edoras and he went with his army to Helm's Deep because it was more defensible. I don't know, have most of you seen The Lord of the Rings? 
some of you have anyway. Okay, so they, okay, now he did that, but I don't know if you remember, at the court of Theodon, there was um, a nasty piece of work called Worm Tongue. And Worm Tongue told Fireman that Theodon was going to Helm's Deep. And so Fireman marched with his ox and urukais to Helm's Deep. Okay, and battle commenced. So there you have a little path model. Initial cause, final effect. Okay, but one of the things about a path model is if you miss out essential things in your explanation, it's, you know, it's not a very good path model. Now, there are things missed out of this. Can any of you think of anything that's missed out? I mean, lots of things are missed out, but let's sort of just pick on the things I've picked on. So what, there's something essential that is missed. Anybody know? Okay, nobody knows. <laughs> maybe nobody likes, maybe nobody enjoys the Lord of the Rings like I do. The reason I think it's not complete is that, yes, there was a battle at Helm's Deep, but actually Theoden and his army were, were on the back foot. And when Saruman breached the walls, they had to retreat to the fortress. So they, were, they almost lost, lost the battle. Now, what saved the day? Does anybody know what saved the day? Gandalf saved the day. <laughs> Gandalf, <laughs> Gandalf arrived with the infantry. And that made all the difference. So you see, there you go, you see. You, in your path model, you have, you obviously have a theory about how things fit together. And that, that illustrates that. Now, when you use, did you want to ask something? Yeah, because I'm okay. go on, like Lord of the Rings. So we've got all these big things, but what about the small things like Legolas and Gimli fighting? Just generally, everyone fighting, but that also contributes to it, doesn't it? So if they would not have been fighting, it doesn't I know, to go I know. I'm only trying to be simple. I was only, I, I'm actually, yeah, you are quite right. And, and actually, it illustrates an important thing about path models. The path models don't tell you about causality. They tell you what is associated with what. If you miss things out like those things, then your path model will be incomplete if they're essential, okay? So let's, okay, it's a bad path model. <laughs> this is my memory of it anyway. So for, what you can see from this is that you've got all these paths here, and you can have direct effects. So Theoden leaving Edora and the battle at Helm's Deep has a direct path. But there are also indirect paths, like this one here, with worm tongue. Now, path analysis allows you to assess direct effects of any predictor variable on any outcome variable. Predictor variable on an outcome variable. It also allows you to look at indirect effects, and it also allows you to measure the total effect from your initial cause up to your outcome. You can do all sorts of things with path models, okay? Um, so, and the only other thing to tell you is the obvious thing that you all know, which is that when you're doing research, your um, concepts are only as good as the way you operationalise them into variables. Okay, so you can have problems there as well. Now, I'm going to show you an example from my own research. Okay, so let's get on to that bit. Now, the question I was trying to answer was about the relationship between occupation and health in older people. Because it's well established that occupation, the occupation you have, has an effect on your health if you're working. But, the, but when people get near or they get into retirement, it gets a bit more complex, really, because A, they're not working, and B, they might be doing lots of other leisure things that affect their health. So a basic question, I just want to look at that relationship. Okay. So, 
I start off with my initial chords and my final note from. Now, the way that I want to look at occupational class and health, I said that class analysis is great if you test certain hypotheses. Now, another way of putting that is you should really have a theory about how your variables fit together in a sort of in class model. Now, I'm using an overt theory because I like overt theories, and I'm using a Bordeauxian theory about the relationship between occupation and health for older people. Now, what Bourdieu says is that there's a relationship between social class and life chances. So for me, health is an example of life chances. And for Bourdieu, social class divides into the primary component, which is occupation, and the secondary component, which has to do with lifestyle, and which I'm sure you've all come across, you can um, conceptualise in terms of economic capital, cultural capital, social capital. And that's how I did my, um, that's how I came to do my model. So, the way I did it, I stepped it, so I had occupational class. Obviously, the amount of wealth that, that people in older life have is likely to relate to their, to their occupation during their life. So that represents economic capital. And then I have other lifestyle things. And they're here at this third level. And they basically represent cultural capital and that is as well. And voluntary work is social capital. So, okay, it's a very small model. I want to show you how class analysis works. If you did it in research, you'd have it more complicated. You'd have more variables. But I want to do it in a simple way. Um, <coughs> and you can see that for these, for all of these, these are all predictive. And that's an outcome. So for any predictor, I can work out direct effects, I can work out the indirect effects, and I can work out the total effects. I can do that for any of these predictor variables. I mean, obviously, these only have direct parts. Um, now, the data that I've used in my research is actually from the English Longitudinal Survey of Ages. That's an example of a really great large-scale data set. And it's a panel survey in which the same people are interviewed every two years. And it started in 2002. So what I did was, I put all my predictors, I got them all from the first wave from 2002 to Malta. And then the health variable is actually it's actually health change. And that comes from, it's actually the worst outcome between 2004 and 2011. It doesn't matter. I'm just trying to say that at least they have an order. So these are, they, they say it's lagged. So they're at a prior time point. So I don't need to worry about causality because these came before that. And that's helpful. But you don't have to do that in, path, in a path model but it takes account of at least one thing. Now, um, my sample was of over 6,000 people, and they're all over 50, so in different stages from um, near retirement to being in retirement. They're all at different stages. Okay. Now, when you do a path analysis through AMOS, ideally, all of these variables should be at interval level. What that means is that the variables have categories that have an equal, an equal amount between each. So, sorry. So, for example, if you have money, the distance between one pound and two pounds is, is the same as the distance between two pounds and three pounds. So, it's an interval variable, an equal distance. Now. Some of my variables, like health, 
they aren't interval variables. They're ordinal variables, which means that they have an order, that the categories in the variable have an order. So you can't really say that there's an equal space between them. And for those of you, I guess you're all doing, are you all doing social science? Not all of you, that's fine. Um, most of you. Um, if you use Lippert scales, Lippert scales are ordinal variables. Um, in the case of health, it's a question that says how good do you think your health, how, how is your health? And it's a scale from very good, good, neither good nor bad, um, bad and very bad. So you can see how that's a little scale. Now, if you decided to do part analysis, in social science, most of our variables are at an ordinal, le ordinal level. They're not interval data. But I use a common assumption, which, may, which is that if you can say to yourself that your ordinal variable is a latent continuous variable with thresholds, if you can say that the, basically those, the divisions between very good and good in health are the same as the divisions between good and neither good nor bad, you see what I mean? If you can make that assumption, then it's probably okay if you keep it as an interval variable. But it does depend who you talk to. And if you do an article for a statistical journal, they probably won't want you to do that. But if you do an article for a, you know, a sociological journal, that would be okay. So it does depend who you, who, what, what your audience is. Okay. Um, now... The basic way of looking at a, a path model when you get your results is that every path will have coefficients. And the coefficients are a measure of how much two variables are related. Okay. And you can actually calculate the direct effect, you can calculate the indirect effect, and you can calculate the total effect. So it's quite, it is useful. So you could, for example, when you're looking at occupation, you could say, is the direct effect of occupation on health bigger than the indirect effect? That will tell you something about occupation for older people, for example, or you can say, is the total effect of wealth bigger than the effect of occupation? You could do that if you wanted. Um, okay, so if we go on to the next thing. Now, this is the page with some statistics on it. Okay. There's a few other things that you need to take account of in path analysis. The first thing to take account of is control variables. Now, control variables are variables that you know have an effect on your outcome, but you're not using them in your, that's not part of your theory about what's happening with health. Now, in the case of, of, of my model, I know that age has an effect on, on health. Because as people get older, they're more likely to be ill. I also know that the effect of age accelerates over time. So I also have another control variable, which is age squared. And that takes account of the way that the effect of age accelerates over time. We also know that men and women suffer from different conditions. So that's another variable which becomes a control variable. The final one for my model is health. If you want to look at a health outcome, see it's obvious that someone's health in 2002 is going to affect their health in 2004. Wherever you start from, it's going to affect your health. So I use that as a control to take away the effect. 
I am looking at health change and I can neutralise the effect of previous health by making a predictor. Okay, so those are my controls. Now the next three bits are actually the statistical bits. Okay, so there are three ways in which we, basic ways in which we use statistics in parts analysis. This one is judging the effects of variables. What is the effect of one variable on another? They're called path coefficients or betas. And they actually come in both unstandardized and standardized forms. And I will explain when, when we look at the results, I'll explain the difference between them. All I want to say at this moment is that when you use AMOS, your path coefficients are based on linear regression. Now, linear regression is a measurement of how related two variables are in a straight line. How much, when one changes, when one variable changes, it, the other variable changes. That's what linear, in a straight line. So, You could conceptualise it in terms of what it was like for Alice. Alice, when she went down the rabbit hole. When she drank the shrinking potion, when she drank the drink me potion, she shrank in proportion to the amount that she drank. So that is a linear relationship. So it's just they are related. She did one thing and it affected, she drank and it affected her son, so. Okay, so that's coefficients. Now, the second statistic you need is something that judges the overall fit of your model. You may have variables in your model which aren't related very well to the outcome variable, okay? So if you have quite a few things, quite a few predictor variables, which don't have good relationships with the outcome variable, your model will not have a good fit. So generally, when you're doing path analysis, this is the first thing that you look at. Before you look at the coefficients, you look at this. And you can think of it, in a way, in terms of, if you went, to a dress shop and you bought a dress in size 20 and you're only size 8, it might fit you. It might fit you in length, but it's not going to fit you in width. And I think about it in terms of, say if you went to Asda and bought a suit of clothes for an elephant, it wouldn't be any use to say <coughs> that the sleeve length is okay, because you know that those clothes wouldn't fit the elephant, they wouldn't fit round, round the, I mean those clothes do fit actually, <laughs> but you get the idea. So just because some things might fit, if you buy clothes for an elephant in Asda, the basic, it basically that pattern doesn't work on that, that creature. Okay, so one last thing to, to be aware of. No matter how well your variables are associated with your, your predictor variables are associated with your outcome variables, they might still only account for a small amount of each variation. So you may have missed out some essential elements of your, some essential variables in your explanation. So you may only be able to explain a little bit of the change in your outcome variable. Now that's, the way that you do that is by this thing R squared. So it's really thinking how much, how much do my predictors explain changes in health overall. So okay, so there you've got your three statistics. Now, if we go on to the next one. OK, 
Okay, so we come back to my simple model. And we'll start off with the two easy things. The goodness of spirit and um, the and, and R squared. Okay. So first of all, the goodness of fit model, the sorry, the goodness of fit index that I'm using for my model is called the root mean square error of approximation. There are many different goodness of fit indices, and a lot of debate about which one is better. Now this one is the only one that's suitable if you have a sample size of 2,000 or more. Mm -hmm. So this is why I'm showing this one to you. Now this measure is based on chi-square. And basically, it's not a scale. If Rimsia is more than 0.1, then your model is badly fitting. So what this says is it's a reasonable model. It's below 0.1. So that's the first thing. Our variables have a reasonable association with the outcome. That's the first thing you should say. Now the second thing was rather sad news. Although those variables worked okay, they didn't explain much of the variability in health. There are big aspects of people's health that isn't explained in this. Now R2 comes up as a statistic like that. If you multiply it by 100, you get a percentage. So what that tells me is that over 90% of the variation in health is not accounted for within my model, so that's pretty pathetic, mm -hmm. isn't it? In social science, I mean, again, people will really vary as to what they might say is a reasonable amount. I suppose I work on a basic thing, but if in social science you can explain 25% of, of the variation in your outcome, then you're doing okay. Not less, but obviously it's better than more research. And that will be a subject of debate with statisticians and things. Okay. So what this suggests, if I got these results, I'd be thinking, how would I modify my path model? Because when you set up a model like this, it's only an initial model. They call it the input model. And you would expect to modify it, to add variables, to take away variables, to let your, vari your some variables co-vary by putting arrows to them. So it might be that these two co-vary, in which case I need an arrow between them. So this is only the initial stage. But I wanted to keep it simple because obviously we haven't got that much time. Okay, so let's go on to the coefficients, which when you get down to it is the heart of it. Once you know, so you start off by looking at goodness of fit and looking at R2. When you've got them sorted out, you can begin to really look at your coefficients. You know, when you feel your model's all right. Okay, so... What we want to answer in this one is what is the relationship between each predictor and health? And what are the relative size of effects between the different predictors? That's what I want to ask. Even though I've only, I'm only explaining 7.5% of why health changes, it's still interesting because I'm using variables which are important and I can look at the relative effects of other things in relation to variables we already know are important generally in health. Okay. So now, 
Your coefficients come in two forms, unstandardized and standardized. And they have different functions. I'm going to deal mainly with standardized ones, but I do want to just say a couple of things about unstandardized beakers. You use unstandardized beakers when you want to know what the substantive effect of a predictor on your outcome is. So, for example, if we're looking at this direct path, I can tell you, using unstandardized beakers, that when you look at occupation and you compare managers and people in the routine path, so that's the top and the bottom, managers have 10% better health than people in the routine class. So you see it's a substantive difference. If you, and sometimes you want to talk about that. You want to talk about um, what's happening in one variable. But you can see that, I can say that about occupation, but then if I want to go on to talk about wealth, I can't compare occupation and health. Oh, no, and wealth's too good. Because I could, for instance, say that if you have a million pounds, you have 10% better health. I mean, it's, it's some weird thing. It is, it's quite a big number. I can't tell you exactly. Now, if I say that having a million pounds is a 10%, gives you 10% better health here, it's hard to relate that to managers and the routine class. So, our standardised beakers give you substantive information about the effects of predictors. But if you want to compare them, if you want to compare those predictors that all have different measurement scales, you, use to, you have to use standardised coefficients. Now, standardised coefficients work on standard deviation. A standard deviation is a measure of the average difference between any observation survey or whatever in question, and the mean observation. So for example, if you were looking at student marks and the mean student mark was 55, you'd have 55 as the mean, but the range of marks that students have may be between 20 and 99, I don't know. So what you would be doing is you'd be calculating the difference between a mean and a score, adding up all those differences and taking the mean. It doesn't matter what a standard deviation is. What it enables you to do is to compare variables that have different measurement scales. That's what it does. So I can say this is bigger than that, and it doesn't matter whether I'm talking about occupational classes or wealth or frequency of going to the theatre. So you can see, if you're looking at relative effects, this is the way to do it, and that's the purpose of the thing I'm doing there. So that's what we'll concentrate on. So let's see how they actually look. Now, first of all, if we look at the largest effects, I have to say that these effects are small. A, I'm looking at health change over a few years. B, the biggest effect on health are, is your previous health your age, and your age, actually. So all these effects are quite small. But you can see that the biggest effects are between occupational class and what's basically cultural capital, going to museums and theatre, and between occupational class and household income, and also occupational class and volunteering. Sorry, can we just back to the, those yeah. effects? I'm only, I'm hard of hearing, but I do need you. Go on, tell me. So are those effects um, after you've taken account of your age? Um, yes. Service? All of the, yeah, yeah. Okay. My control variables are there. Yeah, and I haven't put them in because the control variables, age and sex, are predictors of everything. So it would really make it all very messy. So all of these would have a predictor, which is age, age and sex. A squared and then health as baseline would be there. So I just missed out the controls to make it easier to look at. 
So this is the result. You have your controls. You've done the analysis, dirty job. Those are your big effects. So it's interesting that if you come to the next biggest effect, it's not the direct effect of occupational class, it's the effect of going to the theater or museum on health. So that's interesting. Um, so these, so you can compare all of these together. Yes. I mean, the, the point about the path model is you are theorizing around it. It doesn't give you an explanation. You, it, it, you, you form your own explanation from it. So you are quite right, and you're right to you come a little bit on to that. But yes, that's exactly the right way to think of it. But it's just interesting, the, the different relative sizes. So... So if we now come to the moderate effects, so we've had the strongest effects, and then we've had that thing of theatre and museum and health, and that's the next one, but these are moderate effects. And you can see that the effect of occupational class on health is quite moderate. Um, it's the effect of occupational class on activity level is also moderate. And the effect of wealth on health is moderate. So immediately we have a way of, of looking at our variables and seeing where the main effects are. Um, so I was really interested that the direct effect of theatre and museum going on health is bigger than the direct effect of occupation. And it's bigger than the direct effect of wealth. Now that did surprise me. But of course, exactly as you said, this is affected by wealth and it's affected by occupation. So they are tied in together, but you can see how they're tied in together. And you can also see that the the level of detail you get in a path analysis is more than you get in generally in something like multiple regression because everything, because you're looking from left to right, so everything has a time order. So it gives you detail. So if we just go to the very smallest effects and you can see that there's a small effect of occupational class on, um, on activity. There's a small effect of wealth on, voluntary, on whether people do voluntary work, which surprised me, um, and on wealth to activity level. You can see that there are small effects between voluntary work and health, which surprised me as well. Um, and between activity level and health. So there are some weird things coming up here. Um, one of the things to mention is that I think when we're talking about the way that variables are operationalized, I think there is a problem with this variable because it includes any kind, it, it is, you know, um, vigorous, moderate, etc. But it includes activity in manual jobs. So it's going to include people who maybe had a career or did something else. And then in their 50s, like many, they've gone back to work in, in possibly a menial occupation because they needed to. So what I'm trying to say is, it might be that these people here actually have quite adverse life circumstances that are not within this model and that that affects their health, because it's an inverse <coughs> relationship. So as activity level declines, according to this, it's only small, but health, health goes up. 
on his small. So that, that would immediately ring bells. You know, there's something wrong with that variable. So thinking about what variables you have. Um, so if we just go on to total effects, you can see that the, the biggest total effect is from occupation. And if you look at it, that's the direct effect. Now, the indirect effect is 0 0.077. It's just 0.173 minus that, which is 45%. So what you can say is that within this model, it looks like nearly half the effect of occupation is indirect. So that can be a useful thing. Okay, now let's go from that on to our findings. So what we can say is that within the constraints of so few variables in our model, it looks as if occupation is still important in the health of retire, even of people who are retired or moving into retirement. So that's quite a useful finding. And it is useful to, to, to know that quite a lot of the effect of occupation is indirect. The second one is, is funny, that lots of money seems to give people better health. That again, it's the total effect of wealth was second only to occupation but 85% of its effect was direct, so that's a lot. Now, can any of you think of why that should be? Why should it be that having lots of money makes people more healthy? Health care. Health care. Exactly, private health care. Um, there's that. What a thing. I mean, that's one, isn't it? Yes, you're right. Better food. Better food. Better housing, better environment, more social holidays. You know, it, 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 the list goes on and on. So what that says, perhaps, is that there are lots of material factors which haven't been taken account of within this path model. And again, you might want to modify your path model, model to look at some of those factors and if, if, you've got, if you have the data, to see what effect they have. So you, you, the, your results are, you have to think about them. <laughs> they don't just speak out to you. They, they're part of whatever theory you're, you're using to explain things. Okay. And the other thing I think was quite interesting was that going to theatres or museums had an effect that was bigger than that of wealth, and it was nearly as much as, as occupational class. So that's interesting. Now, I was quite surprised that being a volunteer didn't seem to have a big effect, because if you think about David Cameron and the big society, it pushes the idea that volunteering is good not only for your community, but also for volunteers themselves. And that seems not to be shown in this analysis. So, um, so that's interesting. Now, I need to be quick because obviously you may have more questions. Just some quick conclusions which are related to my research. I think that the path analysis does suggest that class-related health inequalities do persist. There are structures, regularities in in health status in older people. Um, so, it's, so that was quite good for me. And uh, the second point, um, I realised it's not the main effect. I've put there the main effect of occupational class is via wealth. Well, actually it's not. It's just probably one of the most important effects of occupational class is via wealth. And obviously, if your job gives you a high level of family wealth as you get older. It does, as we have discussed, it gives you opportunities 
uh, means that you can arrange your life in a way that suits you and that's likely to help your health. Um, and I think I would say that it, it shows to me what the beauty of path analysis is, that um, it identifies the indirect effects of occupation and doesn't just say occupation has an effect on health. So it's really interesting the way you can pick it apart with, with path analysis. Some final comments, really. Just going back to path analysis, because this is a session about path analysis, not about my research. OK, just, just to remind you that path analysis is about hypothesis testing. Can any of you suggest to me why using it in exploratory research isn't a good idea? Not a leading question, but any ideas? Well, if I say to you that there's a relationship between eating ice cream and burglary, you'd laugh, no doubt. But there actually is. And the reason is that people go out to buy ice cream in summer to eat. If the house is empty, then they're more likely. Then they're more likely to be burgled. So, the relation, so that's what you would call a curious relationship. There is no real relationship between ice cream and burglary. And that's the problem if you use path analysis as an exploratory tool, then you can, you can have connections between any variable. But unless you base that on a theory of how things fit together, you'll find lots of correlations between variables. And it could be endless. So it's, it's basically useful for hypothesis testing or when you have a question to answer and some ideas about how you might answer it. Okay, um, clearly in our particular model used here, there's not enough variables. I just wanted to show you a very simple version of path analysis. Um, so it misses important predictors of health and that's the thing about over 90% of the variance in health is not accounted for by those predictors. So that says something big. Obviously, when you use path analysis in research, you would modify your input model until it becomes your output model. Your output model is what you end up with. But modification is part of that. And you might add variables. You might take away variables. You might put arrows between them or whatever to allow them to co-vary. Within software, you get modification indices, and they're very helpful because they tell you what would be the effect on the fit of your model if you remove variables or if you add them or if you allow them to co-vary. So you have it all there when you get your output, and it will help you. Now, um, another thing to tell you is that this analysis is done with AMOS, as I said before, and that runs through SPSS. Well, I think you can run it independently, but I did it through SPSS. Um, <clears throat> it's good for beginners. It's quite simple, and it has really good graphics. It has disadvantages. The big disadvantage of using AMOS is that all your correlations are based on linear regression. So you are making that assumption that your data is at an interval level. And because you do that, you are more likely to make type 1 statistical errors. That is, you're more likely to have false positives, where you think there's a relationship and there may not be, because you're over using your data in a way. So it's n I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying it's something to think about. Um, a better piece of software to use actually is mplus but mplus is harder to use and it doesn't have the nice graphics that you get in amos but the thing about using mplus is that instead of basing the analysis on linear regression it does mixed regression so it will take your nominal data that's where you have categories that aren't ordered like religions you can't say one is better than the other. It will also take your ordinal data where data has an order, because you don't know where equal intervals is 
during the Classic Day. And of course, it will also take you to a paper. So that's the idea in a way. Um, the last thing to say about part analysis really is that there's a more complex way of doing part analysis, which is called structural equation modelling. Now, structural equation modelling is part analysis, but it usually has an element of um, latent factor or part analysis. And latent factors are variables that you can't measure directly. So, for example, if I wanted to measure po popularity, there is no one thing that can measure popularity, but there's a number of indicators, and people do it in different ways, but I've seen people doing it in terms of the amount of time in conversations people talk about themselves, the amount of time they talk about other people, the amount that people are selfish, and there'll be a, a number of indicators, and you would use them um, to get to your hidden variable of and, when, and as I say, so structural equation modelling would do that. That's the additional element in structural equation modelling. Um, <coughs> now, I have more or less finished here. I just wanted to conclude by saying that I hope this has indicated to you how part analysis can be used in research. And you might be inspired to consider using it 